Good afternoon to you all. My name is Joyce O'Connor and I chair the digital group here at the IIEA. You are very welcome to our webinar on digital innovation in Europe. Before we begin, I'd just like to note one change to our panel lineup. Cecilia Bonefeld Dahl, Director General of Digital Europe, will not be able to join us today due to unforeseen circumstances. Cecilia sends her apologies. We are delighted to welcome her colleague, however, Una Fitzpatrick, who's a board member of Digital Europe and who will take Cecilia's place and will be re representing Digital Europe in today's panel discussion. You're very welcome, uh, Una. And I'd also like to welcome all our other panellists, uh, Carl Gibbons and Henna Verkunen. Una Fitzpatrick is a board member of Digital Europe. As I said, she's vice chair of Digital Europe, a, a Brexit task force, and is also the director of Technology Ireland. Henna Verkunen is a Finnish member of the European Parliament, where she serves on the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy. Henna has had a distinguished career in her own country in Finnish politics, where she previously served as the Finnish Minister for Transport for Public Administration and for Education. Carl Gibbons is Divisional Manager for ICT and the International Service Sector in Enterprise Ireland. She served in several roles advising on digital technology innovation, including the Industrial Development Authority, Science Foundation Ireland, and the Digital Hub Development Agency. You are all very welcome, and we look forward to your discussion later on. This is the fourth event in the IIEA project entitled Europe's Digital Future, which is exploring the topic of digital sovereignty in Europe. As part of this project, which is sponsored by uh, Google, a year long program of events and research is exploring what the concept means and what the future, what future it might hold for the EU and in particular small economies like Ireland. Hello to our colleagues in Sweden, Gunnar Hopemark, in Denmark, Jan Ho Schmidt, in the Netherlands, Brigitte Decker, and in Estonia, Adrian Venables. All are working with us here at the, at the IIEA with Andrew Gilmore, Seamus Allen and myself. And we hope that our first uh, publication will be available in the coming months. We have, as you see, three distinguished speakers today from a diverse range of perspectives on digital innovation in Europe. The panel will examine how Europe's potential can be unlocked and will assess the key building blocks to support digital innovation. Hannah, Una and Carl will address the question of how innovation and investment can strengthen Europe's digital resilience and capabilities to accelerate digital transformation and lead technology innovation. In particular, they will address four key questions. What are the building blocks that are needed to ensure EU innovation? What scale of funding is needed and how can this be raised? What are the roles of government, industry and the public-private partnership? And how can Europe unlock its innovation potential? As you can see, this is a very timely discussion. Our panelists will speak for seven minutes each, and then I will go to the question and answers to you, our audience. Please use the function, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and send in your questions during the, the session if you would like to do that. And I will come to you at the end when each panelist have finished their presentation. Please join us also on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. So I'd like to come to our panel now and our first panelist, Una Fitzpatrick. Una, over to you, and thank you very much again for joining us today. No problem at all, Joyce, and thank you and the entire IAEA team for having me. Um, as, as you mentioned, um, I'm here to represent on behalf of Digital Europe and Cecilia, so I will try to deliver her message, um, though I'll probably not be as, as succinct and, uh, and as excellent as she is. Sorry. Now, are those slides up there? Yep, lovely. You can see them perfectly. Brilliant. 
Um, so just in terms of myself, I'm the Director of Technology Ireland. We're the trade association within IBEC that represents technology companies. Um, technology Ireland, our members of Digital Europe, um, we're one of the, the many um, national trade association members that cover all member states as well as corporate members. Um, and I suppose as my role in terms of being involved with the executive board of Digital Europe, um, we've been heavily involved in terms of the, the advocacy and lobbying activities of Digital Europe at a European level, in terms of you know, ensuring that there's appropriate levels of EU digital and investment uh, and innovation. And I suppose, you know, that, that first line there, that growth rates in the digital economy are two times 2.5 times higher than um, non-digitalized um, industrial ecosystems is something really to note. Um, I suppose that's really the driver of, of why we have pushed in terms of uh, driving and increasing um, the funding going into digital digital at a European level, because we know that the, the return on investment really will be there if it can be delivered upon. So first of all, just to talk about the EU Recovery and Resilience Fund. Um, as you can see, it's a total package of just over 600 and 700, 672 billion euro, which is, mm -hmm. as, you, as you can see, a heck of a lot of money. Um, and, you know, fantastically that 20% of that has been earmarked for digital um, and 37% towards the green transition. Um, I think what's interesting to note is actually a lot of member states have gone beyond the 20% minimum in terms of their own budgeting plans um, and really included digitalization projects throughout um, their entire ORF applications. From an Irish perspective, 30% of, of Ireland's um, application is earmarked for digital um, projects and I suppose that's um, I think just under th uh, 300 million euro so that's a 300 million euro over a two to three year period so again a really really significant investment and a, and a fantastic opportunity. I suppose this program doesn't exist alone though and I suppose we have to be cognizant that it needs to work in alignment um, alongside other EU digital programs of course, there's the Digital Europe programme, which again, isn't coordinated by Digital Europe, it just has the same name. Mm -hmm. um, but that's 7.5 billion, that's really focused on things like AI, cybersecurity, skills, and that's over a six year period. So another you know, significant fund, as well as the Horizon Europe um, funding programme, 15 to 20 billion, again, really focused on research into digital technologies. So there is, you know, from, from our sense of it, you know, really good uh, funding levels there now. And I suppose really, it's we're into the implementation phase and I suppose that's really where the EU strategy for the digital decade kicks in so it really complements complements the ORF with a lot of structural reforms targeted KPIs and a, you know monitoring and accountability mechanisms so there's kind of three areas here so the better uptake of pan-european projects so I suppose what we what we want to avoid seeing is that each member state sort of goes it alone and that there's kind of siloization and there's maybe repetition across member states of, of what people are investing in. I think we can all agree that's probably not a really productive way to use um, these European funds. So really, you know, encouraging um, member states to work together on, on projects, I think we can, you know, see especially in the Baltics and some of the, you know, more Eastern regions that they really, you know, there's member states really coming together. And I suppose from an Irish perspective, we have to make sure that we get involved there, get in the mix and, and really make sure that we're um, involved in some of those leading projects as well. In terms of KPIs, um, KPIs are really important, but they're also really important to have the right KPIs and um, make sure that they're ambitious enough um, and make sure they really target the right uh, digitalization priorities. I think bad KPIs are nearly worse than, than not having them. No, that's it. Well, um, from a reporting and transparency point of view, I think accountability um, is going to be really important here. Um, I think what we want to avoid is kind of, you know, money flowing out but there's no perhaps accountability and I saw certain member states uh, really driving through and, and others maybe not so much and I suppose that will kind of come to come to it later but in terms of the uh, powers of the commission and um, to, to really ensure that uh, member states are, are held to account in terms of how they report and how they prioritize here um, and I think what was interesting obviously within the commission you know there was a team pulled together to to review all the member states and um, recovery and resilience fund applications and i suppose what we'd like to see is that you know similar resources or kind of permanent resources are put in place to really oversee both the recovery and resilience fund and again the digital decade strategy and um, to really make sure that from a resourcing level both at the commission and at member state level that there's really good governance governance and transparency 
And I suppose from an Irish perspective, we in Technology Ireland and IBEC have really been calling for that, that whole of government approach and um, really making sure that there is transparency, there is um, stakeholder engagement, both by industry, academia, all stakeholders and partners. And so it's very clear that the roadmap, um, both at a member state level, but then at, at, at a commission level as well. So in terms of how to ensure that these EU investments really have impact, and I think, um, you know, obviously we've said that the ambitious recovery plans need to be matched with structural reforms. So I think really at, at, a, at a member state level, um, and I suppose from an Irish level, that, you know, the actual structures and governance processes are there to ensure that where, where, fun, where funds and digitalization projects are, are, are enacted upon, that they're really uh, clear in terms of what their return on investment will be. So just to talk through kind of some of the, the key, key aspects of this, um, as I mentioned previously, a European vision so that there's increased cross-border cooperation. And um, we really want to see that, you know, there's as much bang for our book as possible from a European sense. And that means, you know, getting a, as many member states involved in projects together as possible. You know, this is this can only be a good thing and it avoids duplication, which ultimately is, is a waste of funds. Secondly, that the investment matched is matched with structural reforms. So I think what we've seen is that um, a, a lot of member states have, have very clearly outlined that a significant portion of their the digital budget through the ORF is really focused on um, public administration reform, um, which, you know, it, it's a positive, um, but I suppose what we really need to see that the structural reforms that go behind that, it's not really digitalization funds going in to kind of prop up already maybe existing creaking systems. And within that then, that there are very clear and measurable KPIs. So as thirdly is to unlock strategic as an enabler. So I think we're, we're all pretty clear that, you know, data, key enabling technologies and the digitalization of SMEs are really key and, you know, kind of a short to medium term key, key priority. But there are also kind of longer term priorities that I suppose we can't forget, even though this is kind of a, um, you know, we're looking for impact, but we also have to look to the long term impact. And so there we kind of point to skills and that's both at, you know, a children's education level, as well as a reskilling and upskilling of, of existing workers. And fourth then would be the projects that create business opportunities. So Again, what we want to see here is both um, opportunities for SMEs and, you know, from an Irish perspective, that Indigenous Irish tech technology companies will have access to, um, you know, go forward for a lot of these projects. Um, and I really, you know, creates that sort of level playing field. And really that's through clear frameworks and clear uh, procurement guidelines. The fifth aspect then is around transparency and multi-stakeholder collaboration. So again, I know I've mentioned previously that, you know, engagement of stakeholders, transparency, um, really good governance models, but that's going to be really important because I think what we want ultimately across member states is to really see buy-in. Um, we want to see that everyone is bought into the, the European digital decade and that everyone agrees on the priorities and the focus areas. And from an Irish perspective, you know, our, our sense of it is that there is a need for um, you know, a kind of a centralised point at a, at a government level who really is kind of controlling all the levers of the state, be that from, from the public side, but also from industry and, and all other stakeholders. And that there's, you know, active um, and, and honest um, collaboration as much as possible. The sixth point then is accountability and oversight. So I know I've already stated this, but it, it is really an important part of this in order to ensure fairness um, across the member states from a European perspective, we really do think that there is probably a need um, for the commission to have really strong oversight and, and maybe some, some you know, actual teeth in terms of powers and um, to really be able to you know, obviously work with member states who, who might ha have issues, um, but also to, to ensure that the appropriate controls and um, I suppose, you know, uh, restrictions are, are put on member states who maybe aren't um, adhering to their plans um, as appropriate. So finally, in terms of some of our KPIs for the digital deck, you can see some of them there. These are kind of digital Europe ones that by 2025, we want to see 50% of SMEs using big data analytics. At the moment, that's only 12. So some of these, you know, there's, there's a kind of a long way to go in a short period of time. But I think from our, our indications is that there's no reason why it can't happen either. 
Um, at the moment, you know, I think we're all aware that there's, you know, not a huge number of European unicorns, but by 2025, we want to see 25% of the world's Europe unicorns coming from Europe. And I suppose, again, you know, by 2025, that 90% of people um, without formal education should be internet users. And again, really, that's increasing digitalization skills across um, society. And I suppose, again, you know, on, on coming back to the economic aspect, 3% of, of EU countries' GDP should be spent on research and innovation. And I suppose at the moment, the average is two, and I think Ireland is actually even lower than that. So again, um, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a, a major focus for ourselves in Technology Ireland, but also at a, at a digital Europe level. So as you can see, you know, there's a fantastic level um, of, of investment funds available now. I think we can all agree that really the funding is there now and it's the mechanisms, the oversight and the actual plans that are put in place uh, by member states that are actually going to be really important now in delivering. Um, I think there's huge opportunities to, to drive forward and for Europe as a whole to take a quantum leap in terms of, of how it's positioned as a, as a global leader in digital. Um, and it's really kind of up to us and, and through all our associations and all stakeholders to really come together to try and make that happen. Um, you know, I think the ORF and the digital decade really do give us an unprecedented opportunity. And um, we haven't really had this level of funding specifically focused on digital before. Um, and it's really up to us to make it right. And I suppose I'll end on a quote from Cecilia. She often says this, we need to think big, think European and think digital. Thank you very much. of what Europe wants and how it's going about it. So thank you very much for that. We'll come to Henna now. And Henna, you're going to look at it from the perspective of, a, of an MEP with your background, of course, as a minister in the Finnish parliament. So we look forward to your presentation. Thanks very much, Henna. Yes, thank you so much, Madam Chair. And I think it's very good to continue after Una because I very much also uh, share her views and Digital Europe's views, I think there was very important points you, you were raising. I want to thank uh, IIEA for this uh, invitation to discuss uh, digital innovation in, in Europe, because I think this is a very important topic. We know that the corona crisis has, it has very much accelerated digitalization as more and more people's uh, work, studies and everyday life has become digital. And also a significant part of this change, I think it will be become permanent. The EU and the member states, they should not try to roll back the clock. Instead, I think we must make the most of this change. Accelerating the digital economy is going to be a key factor in recovering from the corona crisis and moreover for securing also European competitive, competitiveness. We shouldn't uh, lag behind the, the, our competitors. And of course, because I'm a legislator and decision maker, like uh, Madam Chair said, uh, I'm always, of course, looking very much the regulation that how much it, it encourages innovation in Europe. And we know that according to studies, bringing down digital barriers within the EU could increase the European Union's GDP by uh, 450 million euros. So we know that there's still uh, uh, big obstacles for businesses in Europe because we, we don't have real single market yet, even that we have been tried to create it in, during the last years. But we know that uh, there is still work ahead of us and a common digital single market would also help European technology businesses and startups by helping them to compete against global digital science. So it's crucial that our legislation is designed in a way that promotes rather than hinders innovations. Laws regulating digital services and markets should be holistic and technology neutral and future proof. I think we must avoid a situation where legislation would impose a different set of rules for digital actors, which would hinder their growth opportunities. I think uh, also when we're making legislations in the, in the European level, I personally, I see that this uh, digital part is one of the main challenging parts because the te technology is developing very, very fast and our, mm -hmm decision-making process is so slowly. Often it takes years before 
we we are negotiating on the regulation and be, before it comes into the force and that's why we should always have very long term approach and very technology neutral approach when we are setting these digital rules but i think this is uh, one of the most important uh, points of view to where we have to focus in europe when we are regulating digital markets that we should always take care that it should be innovation friendly it should encourage new ideas innovations and investments in in europe and nowadays it's more and more important that we also promote openness and human rights and protect people's privacy and rights in the online world because we know that internet it's a very big part of our everyday life so it's crucial that the same rules and values then apply in a real world they should also apply online and of course uh, it sounds uh, simple but it's not always so simple because we can often have that kind of uh, uh, practices online that couldn't happen in on offline world so often we don't have uh, um, uh, experience of that kind of business models for example but now for example the new digital services act uh, it includes several provisions that strengthen freedom of speech and human rights and we want to secure them also in the internet world so for example the increased responsibility of large social media companies to remove illegal content uh, new ways to dispute moderation decisions on online platforms and better access also to data for researchers those are examples of of that how we want to make sure that we have the same um, uh, democracy also and the freedom of speech in internet in same time when we are tackling illegal content and, and products in internet uh, una was already underlining the role of investments and recovery package it's it's important part now when we try to boost innovations i'm very happy that the next generation eu package will also uh, include now significant investments in digitalization as uh, as we know at least 20 percent of the package should be used to promote digitalization and it's vital that we meet this commitment important investments include those uh, directly to high-speed and modern telecommunications infrastructure such as 5g channeling research and development funding into a new digital services, investing in cybersecurity and improving citizens' digital literacy. And I see like Una was already underlining that we have to really look at the role of SMEs because there is a lot of potential in digitalization in our SMEs and there's also big differences between them. So I think we should really boost investments in SMEs to digitalization. Uh, but then uh, now I'm, I have nearly used my seven minutes already, but then I want to also mention a few challenges I'm, I'm seeing here. Uh, and of course, uh, one of them is that in the same time when we have the recovery package, and I'm very happy we have it now and we are boosting digital investments with it. But uh, anyway, I'm uh, very disappointed that we couldn't get enough funding for those important projects in our multi-annual financial framework. We we should have had more funding for digital infrastructure there, because often now when we are funding the member states projects, then often the cross border element is forgotten here. So I see that there is risk that because uh, if we have had the some same funding in our multi annual financial framework, we could be uh, more uh, sure that they, the projects are also bringing true EU added value. And I'm also disappointed that, that we couldn't get enough funding for Horizon uh, uh, program because it's uh, the most important program we have for research and innovations and Parliament wanted to increase it for 50 percent but we couldn't reach that so i'm i'm a little bit disappointed for that but of course now we want to make most out of this recovery package and then an other big big challenge now of course is the lack of digital skills and uh, there we really need investments in all the levels in in the i think in the municipalities and regions but also in the member states and in the european level because we we see that uh, it's a it's a very i think a uh, big challenge for whole europe that we have to invest more uh, for the skills and the digital skills and now another problem at the moment is that uh, less than 20 percent of workers in the it sector are women 
Um, this kind of segregates, uh, segregation not only impacts women's employment opportunities, but it's a massive waste of potential also uh, that will also negatively impact the, the content and accessibility of digital services. So I think uh, if I should conclude that how we should and could boost innovations in, in Europe in digital sector, I would uh, underline the role of uh, research and development investments and access to markets. So it means the regulation, innovation friendly regulation, and then also access to talented people. And it means that we have to invest uh, to skills and to digital skills in all the level in, in Europe. So I think these three areas we have here to where we have to invest. I suppose a complementary, a complementary remarks to Una, but also emphasizing again that European component, the importance of having that trans-European approach, and then not forgetting the research and development and innovation at one hand, but also digital literacy, digital skills on the other, which is you know, from a, uh, an MEPs from Member of Parliament's point of view is very interesting because you see all the member states, their submissions going through, but the importance of that and access to markets. So thank you very much for that. And I think it comes in nicely to your contribution, Carl, from the perspective of companies and Enterprise Ireland. Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, thank you, uh, Joyce, Chair at the IIEA, um, and uh, I have to say, listening to my uh, co-panellists, we're in probably in violent agreement uh, across a number of areas on this front. I thought I'd take the opportunity, uh, Joyce mentioned for questions at the outset, and I've put together probably a little bit of a statement, um, and I might drop a level into it in terms of opportunities and also challenges that are ahead and particularly from um, an Irish context, I suppose, uh, in that regard. Um, so I might just go through that. So um, Carl Gibbons, I'm the Divisional Manager for Technology and International Traded Services for Enterprise Ireland, who are a government agency responsible for working with Irish industry um, that is looking uh, at export markets. So if I look at uh, digital innovation, and I would say that advances in digital technologies and the shift to digital adoption uh, were accelerated by COVID-19 in shaping businesses and revolutionizing business operation. So for us, digital innovation is driven by technology such as cloud computing, advanced sens sensors, advanced automated and autonomous systems and robotics. They're key underpinning enablers for transformational change. So in terms of the Irish context and Irish manufacturing in particular, and services companies in both traditional and new sectors need to have digital capability embedded into their strategies to succeed in global markets. We know that companies that adopt digital will grow faster with the ability to use data to inform decision-making and drive scaling opportunities. This is critical. Successful implementation of digital across all aspects of business operations present these opportunities, gaining competitive advantage and customer experience, internal operations, but also employee experience. And this leads to business model innovation. This will support productivity growth and innovation in goods and services across the value chain. And this is not only for Irish industry, this is across SME industry across Europe. But despite the opportunities, companies of all sizes face challenges. And Hannah mentioned some of these challenges in her piece. In implementing and developing change in digital transformation. So the availability of in-house digital skills, the mm. understanding their level of digital readiness, no digital adoption strategy to guide the implementation of a digital plan across all aspects of the business. There are costs, we mentioned investment earlier, costs in terms of investment in research and development and innovation, training and expertise. And also importantly, as companies move along that digital adoption to digital transformation, it's interoperability within their existing systems. So the Irish government is committed along with the European 
counterparts to supporting businesses on their digital transformation journey. The recently published Economic Recovery Plan seeks to kickstart a jobs-led recovery and propel economy, the economy forward to more sustainable digital and secure future digital adoption. This, from an Irish context, will be driven by the forthcoming national AI strategy and digital initiatives, such as a programme to drive digital transformation of enterprises. It'll be key. At Enterprise Ireland, we are committed to supporting Irish businesses to harness digital technologies to transform, transform their business operations and succeed in international markets. So just to go through a little bit to support the companies on their digital journey, uh, Enterprise Ireland provides financial and non-financial supports. We have an innovation offer to assist companies plan out their innovation and the digital transformation. We have funding supports for research and development, including collaboration with the higher education and research performing organisations. And this is akin across Europe in terms of that collaboration third level sector piece. Mm. We funding for business innovation via implementation of new and innovative production, delivery and organisational methods. And what does this really mean? It comes down to being able to look at capital equipment, but it's the people piece and the people piece in digital transformation is absolutely critical. It's about that capability building through training, leadership and innovation. And while digital transformation will be led by companies, the presence of enabling conditions, and Una spoke about this and Hannah spoke about this, that facilitate the development of new technologies as well as diffusion and absorption will play a key role in digital transformation journey across Europe. Enterprise Ireland, we're playing our part. And despite the COVID impact of 2019, we invested in 125 new potential startup companies in the area of digital, such as cybersecurity and others. We have a technology center program. And over the last number of years, we've been embedding supports for industry-led technology centers, such as CEDAR, Ireland's National Center for Applied AI and Data Analytics. And this center is driving research development and the deployment of AI and data analytics technology and innovation supports to business. In addition, over the years, we've built up the Irish Manufacturing Research Centre, again, delivering solutions to the manufacturing ecosystem throughout Ireland, delivering business solutions in areas such as automation and robotics. The, digital, the Disruptive Technology Fund an initiative of the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment alongside Enterprise Ireland, a 500 million fund, is driving collaboration between Ireland's world-class research base and industry, as well as facilitating enterprises to compete directly for funding supports for the development and the deployment of innovative technologies on a commercial basis. Under this fund, digital projects are being supported and particularly looking at data analytics into AI, machine learning, etc. Under Horizon Europe, Enterprise Ireland is supporting companies and researchers from across the higher education sector and across Europe funding schemes to support that development, that collaboration, which is critically important to underpin that digital transformation. So in summation, digital transformation is a key challenge, not only for Irish enterprise today, but across the SME across Europe. But despite this, and I know firsthand from working with Irish enterprises, they proved many times before in every corner of the world their flexibility, their innovative capability and resilience. And the message that we would give to companies in respect of digital transformation is take action now, get informed, get the supports and take decisions, both in your immediate and also in your longer term to maximize your opportunities and manage those challenges that are presented. And we, as a government agency, are committed in supporting companies along this journey by driving that innovation, that competitiveness, and that internationalization. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you very much, Carl. And I think you outlined very clearly the, the support uh, that's around, but there's a clear call, I think, from what you're saying to take action now get support and work on the ideas. And as you said at the beginning, 
there is a commonality of thought and understanding between all your speakers from different perspectives, which I, which I think is interesting. Um, and uh, we, we, I'd like to go to the questions, but before I do that, uh, all of you have mentioned in, in one way or another, um, the whole issue of, you know, whether you call it citizens, digital literacy, upgrading skills, um, capabilities within organizations. Um, how do you think we can go about really addressing that issue effectively? Um, Una, would you like to start with that? Yeah, no problem. Um, well, I suppose I have some insight into this in terms of True Technology Ireland. We actually have two um, Technology Ireland skill nets. So I suppose very much at that kind of upskilling um, at, a, at a kind of a company and worker level, um, we're, we're seeing great results there across multiple sectors, not just within the, the tech sector, but um, ma many other sectors as well. And um, we've also recently um, written a submission to the Department of Education who opened um, their new digital strategy for schools consultation. So um, we've worked alongside all our, our industry members to, to kind of get really the viewpoints um, of members and, and kind of feed that back um, into the department. And actually, interestingly, you know, there was nothing too groundbreaking um, within that either. I mean, it was, it's just the put the resources in place, support teachers. I think having all of us gone through um, home homeschooling, I think we can all say yes. today, <laughs> it's not the route we ever want to go. Um, exactly. <laughs> only in cases of emergency. Um, but I think what, what has happened um, in the last 18 months is, you know, we've learned a lot and I know speaking with teachers and principals, you know, there has been um, a lot of learnings and that we really feel we're at a crossroads now. And this is really the opportunity. And I think all of society in, in some way we're at the crossroads now we're hopefully touch wood we're coming out of covid and a lot of people have upskilled digitally um you know i i know from personal experience of setting my, my mother up on zoom and downloading podcasts and all these things that she had no interest in before uh, but became very important for her to be able to continue to live her life um, so that I think there has been a, a you know a somewhat of societal upskilling during COVID and obviously with schools and that really we're at a crossroads now and I suppose it's it's up to us in order to to move on and take the best of what we've learned and bring that to the next level. Um, so I think you know you know um, organizations such as Skillnet who, who can offer you know really either free or subsidized training is really important at the, at the kind of work or economic level but also at the schools levels at the appropriate supports and investment put in there and that comes down to from about a hardware but also you know um, IT support everything else you know teachers have a lot to do and I really really mm -hmm. emphasize they can't be expected to you know give IT support to 30 pupils in their classroom that's just not possible and um, so I think you know appropriate resources like that are, are really important. Can I just before I go to Hannah and Carl just keep up on, on that because everybody talks about the schools but I wonder would you think um, this is assuming you'd go to primary level but also maybe to look at that support support but actually training and interventions for parents and teachers around their children because I think that children will react very quickly, as we know, but it's to give the support kind of reflecting the digital divide and the research that's come out recently. Is, is that, so we have to maybe see uh, delivering some of those programs slightly differently. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, we're involved with a group with the department that has, you know, the National Council of, of Parents groups in, yeah. both at the primary and secondary level. And they've definitely communicated that back that, you know, mm clear communication with parents, you know, clear guidance in terms of, of how to use the technology, but also mm. what it's appropriate for, not appropriate for, um, and really getting the parents on board is, is a huge part of that, uh, that journey. That's and again, good. Yeah. We, we've all learned a lot during COVID, uh, but I think that we've also learned things that did work well and didn't work well. So um, mm. I think to build upon that would be useful. Thanks, Una. Hannah, from your perspective uh, as a legislator, how, how do you see us penetrating into citizen level literacy uh, mm. as well as work and, and Carl may look at that in this particular case. Yeah, we have very big differences between the member state if, states if we look at the digital skills of, of the citizens. But if you look at the whole European picture, we can see that one third of the European employers 
lack necessary digital skills. And 70% of companies in Europe, they think that that is a problem for investments in Europe, that the workforce doesn't have those digital skills which are needed in everyday working life. So I think uh, we have very, very big challenges because in the same time, I think everybody should have basic digital skills. And of course, we have to start from the schools, but the, also lifelong learning and possibilities to update skills is needed. I think nearly in all the member states, there is a lot to do for the possibilities, how the people who are already in the working life, how they can update their skills, how we can make sure that they have life learning possibilities. Mm -hmm. And in the same time, when everybody needs uh, basic digital skills, we also have to educate people who are experts in ICT and who are professionals in cybersecurity security or AI or, or very uh, important fields which are coming up. So I think um, have to work in all the levels. Yes. Of course, the education is very much on the competence of member states, but here I think it's important to learn from each other. And like it was already mentioned, for example, in the schools, it's crucial that the teachers, they have the skills because yes. otherwise yeah. they are not so willing to, to use these uh, tools also to teach the kids. So there's a lot of work, but I think very important uh, that we are investing to digital skills. Yeah. In, in, fin in Finland, from where I'm coming, uh, our citizens, uh, if we are comparing in the European level, they have uh, very good digital skills. And the secret behind that is that the banking sector in Finland has teach to be able to use the internet because in yes. 1990s, yeah. We, we had very big banking crisis in Finland and then the banks, they, they were digitalizing their uh, services very, very fast uh, in 1990s and everybody had to learn how yeah. to use their bank accounts via internet. And now that's why everybody knows now how to, how to use internet. Thanks for the banks. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll have to remember that, Hannah. Thanks very much for that, those observations. Carl, you're, you probably focus mainly on business. Do you see that has been a really big issue? So um, the, the, I suppose if I take this from the point of view of when you look at, a, at digital and you look at that digital adoption and digital transformation, and what does that mean from a business perspective? I think with all of this, you start right at the top, you start at CEO level and you look mm -hmm. at the awareness building that needs to be undertaken. And I mentioned in my statement there, it is about people. It's about people first, it's about process, and it's absolutely about the technology being the last because that's the piece that has to be adopted and implemented. And we look at digital, it, it is actually looking at a digital mindset and looking at digital first. How can I change? How can I become more efficient? How can I look at my internal process within my company for my product or my service? And actually, what does that digital first piece need to look like? And then if you look outside in terms of your customer requirements, how do I translate my customer requirements back into that digital, be more efficient, increase productivity yeah. piece? So that whole digital mindset is critically, critically important. If I take a second look then, and, I, and we were talking there about digital skills, um, we have seen huge progress with respect to industry coming together small, medium, large industry coming together mm. to, to look at solutions themselves in term, terms of training needs and training requirements, particularly across the ICT skills base. And across mm. Europe, it's the same conversations. And there are times when industry comes together to be able to try and solve some of those solutions themselves. It's really, really, really important. And that training and that upskilling and effectively lifelong learning um, for employees is, is particularly important. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Carl. Th there was one question I, I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, public policy and regulating new emerging technologies. How can the right balance be found between regulating to protect the public interest and ensuring innovation is not hindered? And what principles should guide policymakers in this? Hannah, we might start with you on that. Yeah, thank you. I think this is very important uh, question what, and we are discussing about it every day, I think in the European Parliament, because we have 
now we have very much uh, digital legislation coming up and on ongoing here in the different committees and i think it's very problematic if we start to regulate the technology because then it's always up to it that how we are defining the technology like now when we are speaking about ai and what kind of rules and ethics we should use in ai and uh, when we are defining what is ai and what kinds of, of rules there should be then what is outside of this uh, definition do we have different rules there Please. then so i think th this is very very problematic and we have to really find the right balance here because i think the main principle should be that we should have the same same rules in online world and offline world and we shouldn't have different rules for different technologies when we speak about ethics for example so yeah. that that's where we are now uh, working in the working european through. parliament all the time yes yes it's yeah. it's very challenging because like i said the technology is developing so so fast and we we don't really see that what will come next and that's why we should be always very technology neutral when we are setting the rules rules yeah Thank you very much for that. Carl, would you like to come in on that? Do you see that balance in your day to day? Does it come up as a practical issue? Um, I, I, I believe it does. And I think uh, just as uh, Hannah mentioned there, the, the, the piece for us in terms of that regulation piece is looking at the emerging technology base. So if you look at maybe artificial intelligence in particular, the ethics around artificial intelligence mm -hmm. to ensure that there's no bias creep within that area is really, really important. Um, and anything that can uh, help um, companies in particular understand that, I think, all the better. Um, and that allows them for, for further development um, and open innovation. Yeah. Thanks very much, Carla Nuna. Would you like to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I'd agree with everything that's been, been said already. I suppose our um, view, I suppose, very much from the Digital Europe point of view, is that, um, you know, regulations aren't a bad thing. Um, once yeah. think that there's a risk-based approach taken, um, and as you said, that it doesn't overly hinder innovation. Um, and I think, you know, having, having multi-stakeholder collaboration around the development of frameworks um, is really important. And I suppose, again, when, when you talk about reg regulations or regulators, you know, there has to be resources in place because I think what we can see and we've seen examples is when you have regulations and regulators, the regulators need to be resourced to actually do their do their job and actually not provide roadblocks then to, to companies in terms of how they develop. And um, so I think that's something that, that we've definitely seen at, at, from, a, from a European yeah. and Irish perspective that, you know, really work collaboratively in terms of the development of, of regulations and, you know, as, as much as possible, take that high level approach so that it doesn't hamper innovation. But again, when you're going to introduce a regulator and um, that the regulator is appropriately staffed and um, that it's appropriately funded and the appropriate level of expertise is in, within the regulator as well. Thanks very much. I, I don't know if you saw this morning, I just heard it, a uh, report by William Fry, which is from an inspector's uh, or investor's point of view. And their report indicates now that investors' priorities have changed since their last completed their, their survey in 2016. And they found that having a regulatory uh, regime is the most important driver of business. Uh, for seeking to make uh, data-related investments. And when they were asked about this, uh, I thought it was interesting. They said they wanted a framework, as you said, and they wanted stability. So it's interesting, you know, tax is number eight now, a regulatory framework is number one. So it, it's interesting how things develop, but it has to be clear and, and as you say, appropriate to the function. Um, we've a, a, a question in here from Jerry Byrne, from Professor Jerry Byrne from UCD, and he's asking a, a different question. Does the panel have an opinion on the fitness for purpose of existing models of innovation for the tech sector in the context of the European digital decade? Is that clear? Um, is that within that document or under the European Hannah? Would you like to answer that?
So what I said, looking at the purpose of existing models of innovation for the tech sector, sector what's the fitness of purpose? Are they fit for purpose uh, in the context of the European digital decade? Of course, what we are we are doing, uh, I think, as the decision makers, I think we should create that kind of uh, playing field that uh, encourages uh, uh, private investors to innovate and invest in in Europe. So I think it's very important that we are we are trying to create a level playing field, fair competition, and like uh, like uh, moderator already said, that uh, the companies are also very much looking at that. We should have a long time certainty for the investments and uh, they shouldn't have that kind of uh, risks. For example, when they are investing into new technologies already, for example, AI was mentioned here, or then we have, for example, blockchain technologies and that kind of uh, new, new ideas coming up. So I think the legal certainty, long-term perspective is really needed and uh, also that kind of technology neutrality. And of course, we have to take care in the European level that we have, for the companies, we have access to finance, access to markets, and also access to talented people. But then anyway, I think uh, it's the companies and industry and researchers, they are deciding that to where they should invest in and where, where is the future of our digital, digital decade. So I, I think we as politicians, we shouldn't uh, win the losers or winners. We should give the opportunities. Neutral. Yeah, and create the, uh, uh, if you like, the environment for that development rather than being too specific. Um, th there was another question there because you raised it uh, just briefly, Hannah. There, when it comes to new and emerging innovative technologies, what can be done to encourage uptake and reduce barriers? You mentioned blockchain, but also cloud computing, even you know, quantum computing. How, how do we start getting people both to know about them and be aware of their impact and how they perhaps work in, in a kind of technological stack that they're uh -huh. not all separate, you know, they are in some ways linked together. Mm. I think the first thing we should do in Europe is that we should invest more the research and development because we know that uh, all the member states, uh, they should invest 3% uh, of GDP to research and development, but we are lacking behind. We know that USA and Japan and Korea and now even China is investing much bigger part of their GDP to new innovations, to science and research. So I think... This is the key for our future. That we should have investments there because otherwise our industry won't be competitive in the future. And we can't also tackle all the global challenges we are facing if we are not investing into science and research and innovation. So this is my main worry. And of course, then uh, after that, we have to also take care that our industry, research, uh, researchers and public sector, that they are working together. Okay. And here, I think... Uh, uh, our ecosystems in digitalization, they are very important. And a uh, big part of this important work is done in the regional level, in the cities, uh, where the industry, researchers, public sector, citizens, they are working together. And I think the innovations are very much created there in the cities and in, in the regions. And in a collaborative fashion between industry or you know the universities research and development and, mm. and business obviously carl would you like to add to that and then una yeah just to i suppose the the collaboration is hugely important and i mentioned some of the the technology centers which uh, are and would resonate with our european colleagues the, but the piece i suppose to to really keep an eye on in terms of innovation for small to medium enterprises is that the day to day becomes incredibly busy and particularly the impact that we've seen in COVID um, and also in terms of the markets. And then as the markets open up and companies become busy and challenged again, is that that innovation step that they may have taken before doesn't get lost or forgotten or put on pause. And we would have seen um, through Enterprise Ireland, uh, particularly uh, during say 2008, 2009 timeframe, those companies that innovated during that time period actually reap the benefits. So 
for me, it really is looking at those companies to make sure that there is a program of work. And it's the same in terms of digitalization. Mm. What's the strategy? What's the plan? And short, medium and long term um, projections in terms of that and staying the course is really, really important. And the third level sector and the research performing organizations have a critical role to play in that as well in terms of assistance and in terms of skill set to be able to bring on board as well. Mm. And and also practical steps of even introducing companies to each other. Um, somebody might be, you know, not necessarily in your sector, but it could be a few steps ahead of you in terms of how did I do this? How did I put a team together? How did I approach innovation? Mm-hmm. What worked for me, both in terms of that innovative approach or on the digital side, what, what was put in place within my company that actually has worked? How did I bring my workforce on that journey with me in terms of that digital mm-hmm. adoption and yeah. transformation? And Carl, can I just ask you on that? How how do you facilitate that in a sense, peer to peer or you know, industry industry, really honest dialogue? You know, that people want to tell you, you know, this was difficult, this was challenging, this is how we did it. How 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 can you encourage that in a very practical way that more people will do that? I think that will resonate with a lot of people. Um, so a lot of the work that we do as an agency is that one-to-one and one-to-many mm-hmm. in terms of group sessions with companies. But it is that feedback and it is about actually looking at research and innovation, looking at digitalization and stepping it out in terms of small bites and also in mm-hmm. terms of consultative approaches uh, for companies. Um, it is about putting together uh, digital hubs, for example, yeah. across Europe. Um, and it is about actually handholding in a lot of cases companies who know they need to change, don't perhaps have the technical skills in house to do it, but that they can go to a hub, a technology center to get that advice um, and to talk to some experts that are there to, to assist them. Thanks, Anna Una. Wearing your your two hats, how do you think this can be achieved? Um, well, I suppose from a you know digital Europe perspective, in terms of how to achieve kind of digital innovation from a from a European standpoint, mm. I mean digital Europe works very closely alongside all the EU institution and the national governments as well as the the trade associations. And I suppose digital Europe themselves have, have published their own kind of investment plan um, to really kind of drive policymakers to outline key investment areas with measurable KPIs and ideas yeah. for cross border projects. Because I suppose, you know. Everyone is extremely busy. We've just hopefully come through mostly a pandemic. And I suppose as an association, Digital Europe is really trying to go to um, policymakers with solutions and um, not just problems and really kind of yeah. have, have researched in depth. So have you know gone out to a lot of tech scale ups, you know, really some of the smallest companies out there for their views on, on the investment priorities and structural reforms that are either roadblocks to them innovating or, or developing. And then I suppose from a digital Europe perspective, really closely following what the national plans are, communicating yeah. the analysis back to the perm reps um, and really kind of making sure that the commission is informed um, and feeding the view into the strategic outlook and the implementation then of the Horizon Europe and digital Europe programs. Um, so it's really that kind of the, the full circle of getting all the views from the members, putting forward plans and also then feeding back into the commission how, how things are progressing. That's really the, the role of digital Europe in terms of the, the achievement of digital innovation across Europe. And that link with companies, but also with policymakers, as you say, solution focus rather than problem centred. Exactly, exactly. Um, well, that, that's probably a good note to end on. Unfortunately, we've lots of other questions, but time has caught up with us. But I think it was very informative. I learned a lot today in a sense about really what I think you'd call the digital mindset, what's involved in this transformation. Um, And, you know, Cecilia and yourself, Una, said this, think big, think think European and think global. How important is that? But within that, then being accountable, being transparent, and also looking at what Hannah and Carl have talked about, the importance of that, uh, the the stakeholders in this, the the importance of collaboration between stakeholders, between industry and between policymakers and 
and the important role that MEPs plays, Henna, in setting that agenda and understanding what it is. But fundamentally, I suppose, what we've come to here today to really has come out very clearly that it's not really about the technology, it's about the people. It's about how you involve people, how you look at their values. And I, interestingly enough, you know, I was thinking, uh, you know, they were talking about the leaving certain CAO this morning earlier. And I was just say, saying that one of these days, one of the key issues that everybody's going to take are ethics, philosophy and ethics, because that's what the discussion is coming about. How do we want to live our society? Having clear strategy, um, what you call for, Carl, about taking action, getting support and getting ideas, but it's done within that context of values and people and working from you know, the citizens right through all the different stakeholders. So thank you very much to all of you. You raised uh, uh, Una, Penna and Carl. Thank you so much for raising these issues. Um, I'd like on your behalf to thank our audience for the questions and for their participation. Um, thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you at our next event, which would be on the 26th of July. But I'd also like to thank on your behalf, Lorcan, uh, Mullally and the production team at the IIEA and Seamus Allen, who's our digital policy researcher for all the work that he's undertaken to, to get this event up and running. So thank you all very much. Um, and we'll see you soon again. Mm -hmm.